Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. I was trying to think where to start this tale, and I think I will begin on that Friday night in April. I may jump around a bit for some background, but let's start on that Friday. It was Friday afternoon a little after 5, and I was done with work for the week. The weather in Oregon can be unpredictable in April, but today was gorgeous almost 70 degrees, sunny, not a cloud in sight. I was in a good mood, work week over, and this great weather. What am I going to do this weekend? That's when my mood went south. I had no plans, no dates, nothing to do. I have been divorced for three years, 28 years old, at this point in the story, and not dating anyone. I have tried the online route with no luck, just a waste of money. Most of my friends are married and a couple of the blind dates they have set me up on were flops. My ex is in a solid relationship with a woman and they may be my closest female friends. Creeping into my head is the thought, what's wrong with me? I pulled up to my house and felt momentarily better looking at the structure. Through my boss I had gotten a great deal on the house. It was definitely a fixer and I had spent a lot of time trying to get it back in shape. I had made progress. The 1950s era mid-century modern had been a reclamation project and I had invested a lot of time and money to get it to the point it was at now. My industry connections and the lumber business had helped. I got home, grabbed my running stuff, and went to change. I looked at myself in the mirror, six foot of fairly solid 190 pounds, not washboard, but certainly some visible abdominal muscles. According to my ex, I was not bad looking. So what was wrong with me and how is it I have not had a meaningful date in many months? I was starting to get depressed, so I took off on my five-mile run. I always feel better after the workout and was enjoying a beer in the late afternoon sunshine on my back deck when my cell bust. It was my ex-brother-in-law Mike. Hey Cam, what's shaken? Mike is in finance and the little money I have, he takes care of. He is really good. His wife Megan is beautiful, fun to talk to, and keeps his enormous ego in check. What do you got going tomorrow? Knowing I had nothing but reluctant to admit it, I implied I was busy but had some flexibility to my schedule. Don't tell me the old man has you working on Saturday. A little background at this point. I work at Specialty Timbers. Mike's father, Ted Robinson, is the owner and my boss. My ex Kimberly is the accountant and Mike's sister and Ted's daughter. Mike never went into the lumber business, got his MBA, and now he has his own investment business, Robinson and Associates. Growing up, my mom, my sister, and I weren't exactly poor, but we flirted with that socioeconomic strata. In high school, anything beyond the basics, I had to pay for myself. After football season my junior year, I went to the counseling center and found a lead for a job at a company within bicycle distance of my mom's place. I knew if I ever were to get a car, no one was going to help me pay for it. That Tuesday at 4 p.m. was the first time I entered the front door at Specialty Timbers. It was an open office with windows to the warehouse at the back and three private offices on the left-hand side. I checked my note card and asked for Mr. Hannerty. Ten minutes later, an older short guy with long hair falling in his face walked up. I'm Skip Hannerty, and he offered a large rough hand with part of his pointer finger missing. We walked to one of the offices with files, magazines, catalogs, and blocks of wood everywhere. He sat behind his desk, put his feet up, and asked me what I knew about the lumber business. Not very much, I replied. Probably not the best answer if I wanted the job. Then why are you wasting my time? I was nervous and intimidated and didn't know how to answer. He just stared at me. Finally, I said, Mr. Hannerty, I need a job and I promise you I will work hard. He kept staring for a good 30 seconds, not saying a word. I was thinking of what other jobs were on the board at the counseling center when all of a sudden he says, be here tomorrow at 3.30 and be prepared to work. I was shocked, stood up, shook his hand and left. I noticed a tall balding man poke his head out of the last office and look at me. Little was I to know how the path of my life had just changed. So back to that Friday in April sitting on my deck talking to Mike. No, I'm not working this weekend, just a lot of errands to try to get done. Oh bullshit, tomorrow is Saturday and there is an event at the fairgrounds and I have to be there. Megan has a couple of friends coming and I need you to be there with me. I actually wouldn't mind going but I had to act like I didn't. But before I could even start any protestation, Mike said, pick you up at 11. Then I heard the dial tone. I guess I'm going to the spring fair. I met Mike Robinson the same day that I met my ex-wife. By the end of my junior year, I had been working at specialty five days a week, 3.30 to 6 o'clock, and occasionally on Saturdays if they needed it. I had bought a very used Corolla with lots of miles, but it ran well and got good gas mileage. 
I made just about enough to pay insurance, get some gas, and I was left with about $10 extra per week to help my mom. I was excited to start working full-time 7 to 3.30 every day now that school was out for the summer. On the Tuesday after Memorial Day, I showed up bright and early to start my first full day of work. The shop lead was a wiry man named Don Smith. It was Don who I guess he would call my supervisor during my after-school working days. Smitty knew all the machines in the shop, watched over inventory and supervised deliveries and receipt of materials in the shop. He basically ran the back-end operation. He taught me a lot, and this summer I was going to learn more about how the milling, veneer, and other machines worked. My job was basically running the machine's maintenance. What I knew I learned from Smitty. That Tuesday I was informed I got a 15-minute break at 10 a.m., 30 minutes for lunch at noon, and then off at 3.30. Smitty sent me to the break room at 10, a place I'd never been before. It was on the far side of the office, near the women's bathroom. As I entered the office, I first saw this preppy little punk smirking at me. I guess it was because of the way I was dressed. Hiya, Smitty. You're going to cause an energy crisis. I was wearing an old pair of overalls Smitty had given me, and it still had the oval tag with his name sewed onto the bib. It was smeared with oil from my work on the equipment. That wasn't the worst of it. Immediately, I heard a giggle and there was this girl, about my age, good-looking, giggling behind her hands at me. Who were these people? I had never seen them before at specialty. Just then the owner, the tall man that looked at me on the day of my interview, yelled at them to knock it off. I quickly got to the break room, away from these two smug kids. As I was sitting embarrassed and drinking a cup of coffee, the owner, the tall man, came into the break room. In all the months I'd worked there, I had never spoken to him. Don't mind them. They're just my spoiled children. They are working here this summer. But to be honest, I'm not sure what Mike is being paid for. We've never formally met. I'm Ted Robinson. He offered his hand. I mumbled Cameron Joseph as we shook. Good to meet you, Cameron. I am hearing good things about you from Smitty. Let's talk again later this summer. In the meantime, ignore those two jackasses. And that was my first encounter with Mike and Kimberly Robinson. I heard the horn of Mike's black BMW that Saturday morning, only 20 minutes late. Where's Meg? I glanced at Mike, dark sunglasses, slick back black hair, tin face, still the preppy I met 12 years ago. She met Brandy and Celia for coffee downtown, were meeting them at the fair. Hmm. Brandy and Celia. I wonder if this was a setup. We parked and walked a few blocks to the fairgrounds. I got to drop this by the fair. Office, RA is a co-sponsor of the event and Mike was delivering his company brochures. The girls are over by the booths. As we walked up, I saw the gorgeous, blonde and smiling Megan, who gave Mike a kiss and introduced me to Brandy and Celia. Brandy had long, dark, straight hair and very curvy, but a bit of a hard look. She was showing a little cleavage, and I had to keep my eyes up when we shook hands. Celia was different, dark curly hair, athletic build, and a ready smile. She stared into my eyes. Nice to meet you, Cameron. I've heard about you. I snuck a glance at Megan, and all I saw was a sly smile. My weekend was definitely getting better. As a group of five, we wandered the fair, and I found myself often strolling alongside Celia. She had a nice way of looking me right in the eye when we talked. She had a great laugh and I found myself being outgoing and witty. Every so often I would glance over at Mike and catch him smiling at me. It was turning out to be a great day. We spent several hours checking out all the exhibits, occasionally running into acquaintances and having a good time. Mike knew a lot of people and this was networking for his business. We decided to go to Mallory's and grab a beer and try to get an outside table. Brandy decided to head home, something about a headache, and Mike said we would make sure that Celia had a ride. We found a great outdoor table and the sun felt wonderful. Mike told lots of funny stories about work, marriage, and his family. I tried to remember the last time I had such a good time. Celia was fun to talk to, interesting, and asked me questions about myself. After Mike ordered a third round, I made the offhand comment, for sure I need to run tomorrow. Celia asked where I ran and before I knew it, we had a running date for Sunday at 9 a.m. Eventually we left. I was having such a great time with Celia, talking laughing, learning about her life, it was very nice. We just seemed to click. I was just hoping there wasn't some version of a significant other in her life. We dropped her off at her condo, and I told her I would pick her up at 9 for the run on the rhododendron trail. As soon as we were heading home, I got the look from the front seat. What I said as they gave me the smirking grin. Okay, so she's cool. What do you want from me? Running tomorrow with her. Wow, that's fast, Mike grinned. Ever since Kim and I divorced, Mike's been trying to find me a new woman. 
I actually thinks he feels a little responsibility about my failed marriage with his sister. He may have known about her orientation beforehand, but he never said so. I worked at Specialty Timbers all my senior year after school, once football was done. I even worked Saturdays in the fall. I was learning from Smitty all about the machinery from the inside out. During busy weeks, I was asked to run equipment on Saturdays, and I ran everything but the veneer press and learned the capabilities of all the machines. Kim came in on Saturdays and helped with the books. She went to a private high school on the other side of town, so this was the only time I got to see her. She was really cool, fun to talk to, and not stuck up, like other rich kids. About halfway through our senior year, we started dating. What started out as friendship became dating, and before we graduated, we had begun having sex. Kim has a tight body with a beautiful bum and small but pert jugs. I loved making love to her, and in retrospect, I now came to realize that she was not into it nearly as much as I was. But I was blinded by my own lust, and during those moments, I did not notice. We both graduated and both worked at specialty that summer. I wasn't sure what I was going to do in the fall, but Kim was going to Colorado College. I was concerned about being apart, missing her. Other guys, little did I know then other guys were never going to be a problem in just the distance. When I would bring any of this up to her, all she would say is, don't worry, you're the only man for me. She was honest. She just didn't mention other women in the equation. Late that summer, my boss, Kim's dad, Ted Robinson, approached me and asked about my plans for the future. I really didn't know what was going to happen. I had an application for Lane Community College on my dresser. But even as inexpensive as community college was, I did not have the money for it. Turns out Mr. Hannity had cancer. He was only coming in a few days a week, and that was not going to last for long. Cameron, you know our shop. You were good with our customers, and I need some youth in this office. I was thinking of having you work with Smitty when needed in the shop, but mostly I want you in the office learning the business side of specialty timbers. I was shocked. I'm going to start you at $3,000 a month, and when times are good, there are year-end bonuses. I immediately accepted and I couldn't help but wonder if my relationship with his daughter helped me get this position. On Monday, I started in the office. I showed up in my shop clothes. Ted immediately sent me home to change. I began learning the business. I wasn't impressed with Ted's knowledge and easygoing but confident way with customers. I had a good knowledge of products and what our machining could do. What I didn't know was pricing, customer knowledge, and the accounting side of the business. Ted was helpful and patient with me. After initial nervousness around him, I began to become much more comfortable with him. I stayed in touch with Kim while she was at college, and I felt like our relationship was staying strong through the fall. I picked Celia up Sunday morning at 9 for our run. She was in maroon tights and a Lululemon tight-fitting top. She looked awesome, a very nice athletic body top by those black curls, dark eyes and great smile. We chatted comfortably as we drove to the trailhead. I normally do the 5-mile loop, you Oklahoma with that. She was, we stretched, and took off. Whenever you are running with someone else for the first time, you kind of have to find their rhythm, slightly speeding up or slowing down at first, we didn't have to. We were in sync immediately. We chatted as we went, and I found out she was a dental hygienist. She was from the Bay Area. Her dad had passed away. He had worked for the railroad, and her mother worked in a hair salon owned by her mother's sister. Her mom was of Italian heritage. Anna Maria Saltilli was her mother's maiden name. That's where she got the curly dark hair. Talking the whole way, we made the five-mile loop and were back at the car by 10.30. It was so pleasant I could have run another five with her. I suggested coffee and we went to a nearby cafe. I had learned from Mike and Megan on the way home last night there were no known boyfriends or significant others. I did a mental checklist one. No boyfriend. Two. Fun to be with and she seems to like me. Three. Great looking. I began to think my bad luck may have changed. Unfortunately, I knew I still had a lot to do at home. The tile on the fireplace was half done, and the backer board for the shower was sitting in the garage. Celia, I'm having a great time with you, but I have to get going. I would like to see you next weekend. Are you available? Yes, I think so. How about we do something Saturday? We exchanged phone numbers and then headed home. I considered a kiss or a hug or something. I just felt so close to her, but decided I'm going to do this right and play it slow. I was pretty happy as I got home and got to work. As the week started, I debated the proper time to firm up the coming weekend. I texted her Monday after work and asked if she wanted to hike to Rainbow Falls during the day and grab some dinner after. She texted back enthusiastically and added heart emojis. Our first official date. Tuesday was a busy day at Specialty Timbers. 
Ted was in Seattle working with a big potential client. One problem after another surfaced and I was the one that had to fix everything. A late shipment, an unhappy customer, and one of the custom milling machines went down while Smitty was working on the veneer machine. I didn't get home until after 7, I was beat. While I was defrosting a frozen pizza my phone buzzed indicating a text. What now, I thought. To my utter delight it was a checking in message from Celia. My mood immediately changed and we ended up texting back and forth for over an hour. This all just felt so easy and natural. I know it has been less than a week but wow, I was excited about a woman for the first time in a long, long time. Wednesday night I texted her and we had another nice back and forth session. Thursday night she initiated it and we discussed some of the details of our Saturday plan. That night I called Mike and caught him while he and Megan were out to dinner and he said he'd call back. They called back on their way home. Hey what's shaking Romeo? I heard Megan giggle. Just checking in with you guys, how was dinner? I was trying to get the conversation shifted towards Celia but I didn't want to sound too eager in front of Megan. Oh bullshit you don't care about our dinner, but we do know you're seeing Celia this weekend. Your run date must have gone well. I told them running was good and that she seemed like a nice girl. You get her in the sack yet? Mike asked. Don't be an a-hole. Not everyone thinks like you, Megan laughingly said. We talked for a bit more joking and having a good time, and it was time to get off. Man, I have not heard you this excited about a woman since my sister. I explained I liked her so far. As we were hanging up, I heard Megan say, just be careful, Cam. Hmm, I wonder what she meant by that. Friday after work and I had just finished my run, sitting on the back deck and having a beer. What a difference a week made. Last week at this point, I was feeling down about myself. Today, I'm feeling very good. About 8, I sent Celia a text, checking, a few details about our date tomorrow and just to see what she was up to. I checked my phone at 9.30. No reply. That was a little unusual. Oh well. I'll see her tomorrow. I picked her up at 1 p.m. and we headed east into the mountains toward the trailhead. Something seemed a bit off. She was still nice, relatively affectionate, but without the usual energy. When I asked how she was doing, she said, just a little tired. It's been a long week. Before I could learn more about her long week, she started asking about the hike. No more explanation on the long week. We enjoyed the hike and when the trail was wide enough, we walked side by side and she held my hand. Just this small intimacy felt so good after all this time without. The plan was to drop her at home so she could change and get cleaned up and swing back at 7 for dinner at Mazzaletto's downtown. She looked great in tight jeans and a form-fitting top. She gave me a big hug and kiss when I got there. I almost thought if I pushed it, we could be in her bed fairly quickly. But I remembered I was going to play this one differently. The restaurant was cozy, wonderful food and delicious wines. We split a bottle of wine and each had a brandy as we enjoyed dessert. I knew I should sober up a little before heading home, so I suggested we walk the square. This is an area downtown close to vehicles, with cafes, retail shops, bars and other restaurants. The night was pleasant and Celia snuggled up to me as we walked. I think we were both feeling good a little tipsy but happy. A comfortable easy conversation as we strolled past couples and groups of people. As we were heading back I noticed a group of young men ahead and as we angled past them all of a sudden one of them shouts CC. I was immediately on guard, but Celia moved toward them smiling and accepted hugs from three of these guys. Hey girl, what's happening? What you doing down here? Meanwhile, I'm standing there ignored as they all connect. After probably a minute, though it felt like a lot longer, Celia turns to me, flush-faced, and says, Cameron, these are my friends, Bobby, JT, and Marcus. I automatically reach my hand out to shake. The three look at each other smile and elaborately attempt to shake my hand with all types of gyrations. They chatted for 10 minutes about things I didn't follow. I gathered it was about music and a club that I had heard of called Evolution. There was an overwhelming familiarity amongst Celia and these guys. I observed an intimacy especially with the one named Marcus that was curious to the point of unsettling. I felt all the warmth and the goodwill of the evening draining away. By my observation she seemed to be loving the attention and the company of this group. Finally, with hugs and light kisses, they parted. Nice to meet you, I said. Marcus just nodded and they turned and went the other way. About 15 seconds later, I heard them hoot with laughter. Celia snuggled back up with me, but my relaxed mood of before was gone. Were these the kind of friends she had? Nothing wrong with them, but clearly not my scene. She talked about them a bit and I gathered that this evolution was a dance club in the old section of town that was once an old warehouse. She told me how fun it was and that we should go. 
I chuckled and said I was not a great dancer. No one cares, it's just a place to have fun. We drove home, and I tried to be upbeat, but something about that whole scene held me back from being as affectionate as I felt earlier in the evening. When we got to her place, I walked her to the lobby and gave her a hug goodbye. Do you want to come up for coffee? Normally, this is a no-brainer, but a combination of wanting to do the right thing and also sheltering myself from getting hurt stopped me. Thanks, but I'm okay. I'll see you later. I gave her a quick hug and a kiss on the cheek, and I left. Throughout Kimberly's freshman and sophomore years at Colorado College, we stayed close. In retrospect, it was a warm friendship with sex. We saw each other on all her holidays. I looked forward to her visits so much, and she did too. Almost as much as I did. When I would ask her about school, she did not have a lot to say. Sometimes I would get jealous and quiz her about all the guys at school. Finally, once I may have gotten a little possessive about it, and she grabbed my shirt, and with the most serious look I had ever seen from her, she said, I told you there are no other guys, leave it alone, and she walked out of the restaurant. For the most part, we got along great. I was seeing this ideal situation, being with Kimberly, and she and I running specialty timbers. It was too good to be true, but it looked like it could happen. I was learning so much from Kimberly's dad, Ted. He and I had a good, comfortable relationship. I think he was also happy with my and Kim's relationship. I guess he saw me as a bit of an opposite of Mike. Mike was flashy, arrogant, and funny. He was at USC, barely hanging on while partying through his college life. I think he and Ted had a come-to-Jesus discussion and he buckled down and eventually graduated. I, on the other hand, was not flashy. I made up the lack of flash with hard work and a knowledge of the wood products industry. Ted knew Mike was never going to make a career of specialty timbers. QI, on the other hand, was looking like a long-term employee and in a serious relationship with his daughter. Ted was definitely on my side in this whole thing. Here's what happened. I proposed to Kimberly before her junior year, and she said she had to think about it. Halfway through that year, Kim asked for some space. I was heartbroken. I threw myself into work. We still talked and our friendship was strong, but Kim was trying to find herself. We didn't see much of each other through that junior year. Emails and some phone calls, and occasionally I saw her when she came home. We worked together all that summer, but I gave her the space she asked for. Throughout her senior year, our communication fell off. I had even gone on a few dates. Nothing very serious. All of a sudden she was calling and emailing like pre, I need my space times. That summer she came back and we got back together and she asked me if my proposal was still an option. I was shocked. Happily I said yes it was. We were married that Christmas. I was extremely happy. Ted was very happy and as I look back on it I would put Kimberly at medium happy. But at that moment I was blinded by my dream of the girl, the career and the father I never had. Life for me was wonderful, for a while. Kimberly and I worked together at Specialty Timbers. Business was good. I was learning a lot. My relationship with Ted was really good and continued to get better. Surprisingly so did my relationship with my new brother-in-law, Mike. I learned that even though he was a self-absorbed, arrogant little jerk at times, he was fiercely loyal, and for whatever reason he liked me. The first two years I thought were great, but cracks started forming in the foundation and the first big crack was our sex life. From once or twice a week throughout our first two years, by the beginning of year three it was once or twice a month. In retrospect, I could tell she was just not into it. Then Millie moves here. She was a friend of Kimberly's from Colorado. Her name is Ming Lee Pham. She went by Millie. Through Ted's contacts I had bought the house, I'm still in cheap, $125,000. It needed a ton of work and the bank would not even loan against it. I bought it on contract from Ted's old partner and actually the payment was made through specialty and deducted out of my check. Confusing, but Mike assured me this was the best way to do this transaction. I got it habitable and Kim never complained. There was a small guest cottage at the back with plumbing and electrical. Millie moved in. She was an artist and the cottage became her studio. Kim seemed to be spending more time in the cottage than at the house. Millie was always sweet to me and there was no tension. After six months, one day, tearfully, Kim came to me and said she was in love with Millie. I thought she was joking, but she wasn't. There was no swearing, no violence, no arguments. I saw black and I cried. Cried for the first time in almost 20 years. The loss was intense and so sad. I realized I had tied my relationship with Kim to my relationship with her family and my job. My whole life was going to change. For three days, I sat at home and did nothing. The darkest of thoughts took up residence in my brain. I was at the point of very seriously ending my life, and then Mike showed up. He talked. 
Then we talked, and then he listened. He made a phone call, and within 30 minutes Ted was there. Ted assured me that no matter what happened I had a home at specialty. Mike told his dad that I needed a week off. Ted agreed. Mike took me on a road trip where we talked, drank. I cried a little and I thought. On the way back I began to realize a few things. I was terribly hurt, but I had a job I loved. I had a boss and ex-father-in-law I truly liked and respected. And finally, I had a good and loyal friend in Mike. Even Kim and I found a somewhat comfortable friendship. The divorce was easy. She didn't want anything and I kept my house. Most surprising was how nice and supportive Millie was. There were some difficult times, but I had a good support system of people that seems to genuinely care. I did promise myself before I ever got close to a woman again, I was going to protect myself first. On the way home from dropping Celia off, I tried to come to terms with my thoughts. Nothing really happened with meeting those guys. I felt a little disrespected by them and a touch disrespected by Celia. On the other hand, this was just our second date. She had a right to have friends. But there was something about that meeting that told me there was a level of closeness with those guys. This did not fit with the mental image I had of Celia. Maybe I should back off a little. Next day was Sunday, and I had to finish the fireplace and repair some dry rot. After breakfast, I plugged into podcasts and lost myself in the work. For me, the ability to be able to repair and fix this house into the version of it I wanted was fulfilling. For me to own my own home and have it be as nice as I know it will be was particularly satisfying. It was mid-afternoon before I checked my phone, two texts. One from Mike checking in and one from Celia. Brandy and I are enjoying the weather and having coffee. Thanks for last night, Red Heart, Red Heart. Hmm, I had to process this. Was I being too sensitive or should I trust my instincts? I need to think a little more. Later that afternoon, I sent back a non-committal text saying, have a good time. And that was it. Monday evening, I got another text from her saying, how was your day? I waited a few hours and said, good. Years. I got a long text talking about work and a funny story about a dental patient. I didn't reply. Tuesday night, nothing, and I was a bit relieved. Wednesday night, she called. I was polite, but not terribly enthusiastic. Finally, she asked me what was wrong. I said nothing, and then she asked if I was upset with her. I said no, I just had been busy. She invited me over for dinner Saturday night. I accepted. Maybe I was being too petty to get upset over something like this. I vowed to put it behind me and see what happened. Dinner on Saturday was nice. She is a good cook and her condo was nice and well decorated. I began to feel comfortable again and was feeling optimistic. After dinner we ended up in her bed and making love to her was fun and I think she had a good first experience too. We made love again that night and showered together in the morning with more action. Celia has a nice athletic body with a beautiful bum and nice B-sized jugs. We spent Sunday together, and the intimacy of sex enhanced the progress of our relationship. We went for a run, and this time showered back at my place. I showed her around my reclamation project, and she seemed interested in all the work I was doing. I showed her the old redwood hot tub I had picked up from a project we provided material for, and showed her where I was going to put it in the back. Celia was impressed with my carpentry skills, and she seemed to like my house. For the next few weeks, we saw each other two to three times weekly and spoke or texted daily. In a weak moment, I agreed to go to Evolution with her on Friday night. I can dance a little and don't mind it, but I had a feeling this was not my scene. Celia was so excited I could not help but get caught up in her enthusiasm. Evolution was the hip new club in the warehouse area of Old Town. I had heard of it, but had never been there. I told myself in strong relationships you need to make sacrifices every so often. I guess this was going to be one of them. We got there a little before nine. Celia seemed to know a lot of people there, employees and other customers. The place was dark with strobe lights going and a couple of DJs on elevated platforms. The dance floor was a mass of bodies all moving to the music, and it was hot inside. We found a spot in Brandy and some guy came over amidst hugs and laughter. It was difficult to talk with all the noise. Celia grabbed my hand and we hit the dance floor. She was good, and I was way out of my league. Pretty soon we were in the midst of the throng. After a bit, I wasn't sure if it was me or others dancing with Celia. I watched her and could tell she was having a great time. A while later I shouted to her I was going to get a beer. She just nodded and smiled. I waited for a moment to see if she was coming with me, but she was caught up in the dance. I stood at the table and occasionally saw flashes of Celia. So far I had not recognized any of the group we had run into downtown those weeks ago. Celia came back and had a drink, but I could tell she wanted to keep dancing, so we went back. 
I was actually having a pretty good time until I recognized a couple of the guys we had met downtown, and specifically Marcus. Marcus was a great dancer, and he maneuvered, so he was really dancing with Celia. I tried to move in and got an elbow. It may have been inadvertent, but I doubt it. This went on for a bit, and finally I shouted in her ear I was getting a drink, and did she want one? She just nodded and kept dancing. I made my way to the bar and back to our table. I checked my watch, and at a little after 11, I definitely wanted to get out of there, and I kept waiting for Celia to come back and get her drink. Finally, she came back laughing and smiling with Marcus on her heels. She gave me a sweaty kiss on the cheek and grabbed her drink. She took a sip, and then Marcus grabbed it and chugged the rest. Celia just laughed. Come on, let's dance, she grabbed my hand. No thanks, I think I'm done, I said. Just one more, she asked. And then Marcus stepped in, come on girl, I'll dance with you, and they took off. I was pissed, but it got worse. While I was standing and watching, they did all but screw on the dance floor. His hands were all over her, and she looked like she was enjoying it. I was now far beyond pissed. I checked my watch, and it was now after midnight. I was done. I was going to give her until 12.30, then I was leaving. I think it was 12.28 when she came back and I grabbed her, and we headed toward the door. I was mad. I was trying to play it cool. I was not going to yell and scream. All the way back to her place, she went on about how good a time she had how great the music was and how much she liked dancing. The fact that I barely said two words did not seem to register to her. By the time we got to her apartment, she realized where we were. I thought we were staying at your place tonight. I'm beat, I said. How about a different night? I said with a forced smile. Okay, she said and looked at me. I smiled, gave her a kiss and took off. Without question, not the way our dates had ended over the past few weeks. The next day, we had no correspondence. I was wrestling with my feelings. I really did like and care for her, but that scene and her enjoyment of it bothered me. And this Marcus, they looked like more than friends. I was busy both Saturday and Sunday mostly trying to work the redwood hot tub into a spot on the deck. Sunday night I saw I had received a text from her, what's up? I didn't reply. Monday night I got another text from her, hey you, I miss talking to you, call me. I figured I had to answer to this one. I texted back, sorry, a lot going on. Let's connect tomorrow. Okay, she said. Tuesday night, I was still struggling with the situation and I never replied. Wednesday, I got home from work about six and in front of my house was her black Volkswagen. Oh, time to face the music, I guess. I found her sitting on my back deck. What's the deal? Are you dumping me? She looked a little angry. Look, Celia, I don't know what's going on. I'm struggling with some things right now. What? She asked. And then I went into it. I started with my marriage to Kim, and that hurt, and then admitted the jealousy over her friendship with Marcus and my feelings of disrespect at the nightclub. I laid the whole thing out for her. Why not? I may never see her again. She sat there staring at me, and then the tears started rolling down her cheeks. I am so sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you. If it means keeping you, I never have to go to that place again. I want you, and I miss you, and I think I may be falling in love with you. I was in shock. I thought this was the end for us but we just took a left turn and we're going in a different direction. Love. She pledged again that she does not need to hang out with that crowd or go to the dance clubs. I asked her if she was sure and she said, of course. If I had known that bothered you, I never would have asked you to go. We celebrated that night in my bed. The next few months went great. We did lots of stuff and went on vacation for a week in Hawaii. My first time there and we loved it. We hung out with my friends and a few of hers, but never Marcus and that crowd. I never brought his name up. We had been dating now for about eight months and the holidays were coming up. She was at my place almost every night and we started discussing living together. We spent the holidays with my family and the Robinsons. She got along great with everyone except Millie. For some reason there was some distance there. After the first of the year business ramped up, we were selling into Northern California in the Puget Sound and with the building boom our products were in high demand. Ted asked if he and I could get together on Thursday night. Sure, I said, what's up? We'll talk Thursday was all he said. Thursday was busy and before I knew it, it was after five. We met in Ted's office. I found myself a bit nervous by the formality of this meeting. Ted explained that he was going to be 60 this year and he was doing some longer term planning. Instead of a bonus this year, I'm giving you 9% of specialty timbers. I was shocked. This was not what I was expecting, he went on. We have opened up NorCal and Western Washington, and that has been successful as you know, 
but we are now getting a lot of demand in Colorado and some of the resort areas throughout the Rocky Mountains. I want you to open up those markets. It's going to mean some travel, probably a week a month. Are you up for it? Absolutely. I had seen so little of the country, getting to travel to these areas was exciting. And being a part owner, that was very exciting. I was so happy. He went on to tell me that he owned now 51%. Mike and Kim each owned 20%, and I had the remaining 9%. Kim was the CFO, but Mike managed the big picture financial part of the business. I asked Ted if Kim and Mike were okay with me being a part owner. It was their idea, he replied. One other thing on your plate. Smitty is going to retire at the end of the year. Millie's brother, John Pham, is going to start working in the shop with Smitty. I want you to keep your eye on him too. Will do. I said. I could not wait to tell Celia. I was now an owner. I was going to start traveling. I was on cloud nine. She was happy about the ownership part, but significantly less enthused about my travel. How much will you be gone? I explained it would normally be a few days once a month. That seemed to make her relax a little. I jumped right into it and was in Denver within two weeks. I think my straightforward knowledge of the products and the process helped and we immediately started getting orders and I had barely scratched the surface. When I got my direct deposit for March, I saw I had an extra $1,500 gross in my account. I checked with Kim and she said, that's your commission. We pay 3% of gross commission. Didn't he tell you that? I did a little calculation and estimated I could easily sell a half million this first year. That was an extra $15,000 per year on top of my regular salary. I was going to be close to six figures this year. We planned another Hawaii trip for September and I was starting to think about proposing to Celia. After the earlier problems, everything was going really good. I was extremely happy at work and with the extra income of my commissions, I was able to accelerate my work on the house. The house was on a nice size lot, all one level with the guest cottage in the back. It had three bedrooms, three bathrooms, an open kitchen area, a study, and a family room attached to the kitchen. The cottage was a single room with a bathroom and a small kitchenette. I spent a lot of time in the garden. The garden was my oasis, and now with the redwood hot tub, it was spa-like in the back. Celia had dropped her apartment in May and had moved informally. It was wonderful having her here, and for the most part, all was good. There was some tension when I traveled, but I thought we would get used to it. In August, I asked Mike out for dinner. I had something serious to discuss with him. We met at a bar near his office at 6 p.m. The weather was warm, and we sat outside. So what is up, bro? I've decided I'm going to propose to Celia, and I would like you to be the best man. He just stared at me for perhaps a full minute. Married again? You remember what happened last time. This is different. I'm different. I was just a kid then. Neither Kim or I knew what we were doing then. This is now. I love her, and I don't want to be alone. You sure about her? I recall a few bumps, not that long ago, he said. We talked about it more, and I did get a few nervous thoughts based on what he said. It was if he was trying to talk me out of it. I respected Mike's opinion, but he didn't know Celia like I did. I want you to be my best man. I told him I was going to propose when we were on Kauai. We celebrated with tequila shots and ended up having a great night. Two weeks later, I was headed back out to Denver. I needed some samples to show the customers so that Friday, I went out to the shop Smitty was not around. I grabbed my stuff and went to the saw. What you need, boss? It was John Pham. I got it, John. Thanks, though. He quickly came over, grabbed my samples, cut them up, boxed them, and gave them back to me. You need anything else, I take care of. Pretty impressive, young man. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Boss, you need any more help around here. My cousin is a good worker. Good to know, John. And you can call me Cam. Okay, boss. On my last trip to Colorado, I had cold called on a place called Longfellow's. This time, I had a set appointment for Monday at 11 with Junior Longfellow. I met him at their office outside Denver. He was a guy about my age, with a light beard and hair in a ponytail. We hit it off and our meeting stretched into lunch. Not only did they look like they were going to be a good customer, I liked Junior. As we were parting, he told me he was doing some mill tours on the West Coast in November and wanted to come see our operation. These are normally great relationship building opportunities. I told him I knew I had something in Montana one week in November, but I would get back to him. The trip to Kauai was unbelievable. We were at a nicer resort. The commissions helped with that cost. We hung out by the pool and on the beach. We explored the island, went on hikes, snorkeled, kayaked, active but relaxed all at the same time. We had a lot of sex. We found a secluded beach and Celia went topless. She looked like a playboy bunny. I was so turned on. We nearly had sex on the beach, 
but there were a few people around. We more than made up for it when we got back to the hotel. On the second to last night we were sitting on our balcony watching the sunset, and I gave her the engagement ring and asked her to marry me. She cried, hugged me, and we ended up back in bed. As we were laying there I asked her if she was happy, and she said she was. If you could change anything in our lives, what would it be? I asked. She said, nothing, and we were quiet for a minute, and then she said, I guess if there is anything, I wish you didn't travel so much. I told her it should slow down, and that it was important for our financial future, and maybe there may be times she could go with me. Okay, she said quietly. I brushed off the comment quickly without a second thought. Maybe too quickly. Our lives kept going, but now with wedding planning happening also. We decided to do it around Valentine's Day. Celia did most of the planning. I was supportive. At work business continued strong. Our addition of the Rocky Mountain Market increased demand and we did end up hiring John's cousin Nathan Gwynn and another of their friends, Van. Knowing Smitty was leaving I tried to spend some time with John. I saw that he was smart, hardworking, and dedicated. One night he invited me to get a beer with him, Nathan and Van. They were all good guys, seemed to like me, and were loyal to specialty. Lots of stuff happening in our lives and they all appeared to be good things. I decided to hire a contractor to remodel the kitchen. It was a guy I knew who bought from us. I could do it, but it would take months with me doing it, and I didn't want to tear that essential part of the house up for a long time. Celia was involved with the design process, and though we didn't agree on everything, her contributions were helpful. Towards the end of October, I had to go back on the road. Celia was unhappy about it and started to pressure me about a two- or three-day trip, rather than five days. There was no way I could do it in less than five. My November trip coincided with the week Junior was going to be in town for mill tours. I would miss it, but Ted said he would be glad to show Junior our operation. I had a trade show with a customer in Montana, and it was going to give me a good opportunity to showcase our products to this market. The show had set up on Friday morning, and then started Friday evening, and then all day Saturday. I had a flight out early from Billings Sunday morning. On Friday, the show was busy. There was a cocktail party at 8 p.m., and I had a number of promising conversations. Every night when I traveled, I also called Celia in the evening to check in. This Friday, I made it up to my room a little before 10 and called. No answer. Hmm, maybe she went to bed or was in the shower. I called again at 10.30, no answer again. I figured she was asleep. The show started Saturday at 10. I slept till 7, got up, worked out at the crappy little hotel gym, and called Celia about 8.15. Still no answer. After a quick shower, I saw I had missed a call from her. I called her back. Hey, we keep missing each other. How are you? Fine, she said and seemed a little out of it. Not the enthusiasm I expected. Called you a couple of times? Did you go to bed early? No. I had the phone on mute. I was just puttering around the work in the kitchen, she replied. Did they get the tile finished? And then we were talking about the kitchen remodel, completely dismissing the fact that she did not answer the phone the night before. Monday was the week of Thanksgiving, and we would be celebrating with the Robinsons. Celia was a little off all week. Quiet, a bit withdrawn. Maybe the holidays stressed her out. I didn't say anything about her mood. I got an invitation from Longfellow's, our new customer in Denver, to attend their Christmas party December 9th. It was a Thursday night. We talked about Celia coming with me, but I had other business and she had to work so I went alone. They had decorated their warehouse area for the holidays. I knew there would be drinking so I Ubered from my hotel. It was fun and later in the evening I was talking to Junior about our trip to Hawaii. I was showing him some pictures and he saw one of Celia. Let me see that again. This is your fiancé? I said, yes she is, I said proudly. He handed me back the phone then grabbed it again and stared at it closely. He had a serious look on his face. What's up? I asked, does she know someone named Brandy? He asked. I looked at him and said, yes. Why? I could be wrong, but I thought I saw her and some chick named Brandy at a dance club last month when I was out in your town. I got to tell you as a friend they were not acting like they were engaged. This was when I had been in Montana. I was starting to get pissed and embarrassed. I asked him to tell me what he knew. Friday night after touring the mill, I went with another guy to some dance club called Dust. It was what you might expect, loud, dark, etc. At one point, Sean, the guy I was with, was dancing with this Brandy. He said he could have taken back to the hotel if he wanted. But then later her and your woman were with these other guys. I don't remember all their names. They looked like trouble. Do you remember someone named Marcus? I asked. Yeah, that was one of them. He was friendly with your lady, Junior said. Look man, you're a friend. I like you Cam. 
As much as it hurts, I'd want someone to tell me if this happened to me. I know. I said. I appreciate it. I should probably go. Thanks for the party and the info. I got a big hug from Junior and I left. I was steaming, but I had to think about this. Number one. She told me no more dance clubs. This made me mad and number two. What was with the relationship with Marcus? She was lying to me, I just didn't know how much. I didn't sleep much that night and my flight home was delayed. Celia had texted me a couple times, but I had yet to reply. Finally, as I was boarding, she called and I answered. When will you be home? My flight is late and I won't be home till 6 tonight. Oh, too bad. I love you and I miss you, she said. I said, I will see you tonight and I hung up. After finally landing and on the way home, I decided my plan was to see if she would lie to me. I gave her a hug and a kiss when I got home. I inspected the progress of the kitchen. I've got a question for you, I said. Sure, honey, what is it? When I was stuck in Montana at the show last month, what did you do that Friday night? She looked away and said, nothing, just hung out here. You have one last chance to think through that answer. Where were you? I calmly but coldly asked her. I was. Then she burst into tears and ran to the bedroom. I sat and waited. I was angry and sad. I just waited. Two hours later, she came out and told me this tale. She had talked to Brandy the day before and Brandy said they had to see this new club called Dust. Brandy knew I was out of town and said that all they were going to do was check it out. They ended but staying there late and dancing late. And then what? I asked. Then I came home, alone? I said, of course alone. Was Brandy with you? No, she hooked up with an old boyfriend, I think. So you came home by yourself? Yes. She said. Who was at the club? Anyone I would know. Not really. I don't know. You can imagine how the rest of the conversation went. It was like pulling teeth to get hard information out of her. What I finally found out was they went to the club, ran into some friends, and danced a bit. Later, Marcus and his crowd showed up, and they hung out with them for a while. She claimed she left about midnight. Have you ever had sex with Marcus? I asked. Absolutely not, she answered. Does he want to have sex with you? I asked. And oh, well, maybe, probably, but he's just a friend you are the only one I want to be with. She wailed. I told her I needed to think about this and she should stay in the cottage. Sobbing, she grabbed her things and headed to the cottage. The timing could not be worse. We were in the midst of wedding planning. The holidays were around the corner and my entire future was up in the air. I needed some advice and called Mike. He suggested I come over on Friday night. Meanwhile, this week with Celia had been very uncomfortable. She was either crying or apologizing. I was upset. I loved her, but at this point, I did not trust her. Can there be love without trust? I met Mike and Megan at their sleek new home in the South Hills. I gave them the whole story and I asked them what they thought. Mike was of the opinion that if you cannot trust someone, you shouldn't marry them. Hard to argue with that. Megan said this. I feel a little responsible for introducing you too. And I don't know Celia all that well, but I do think she is a nice person, not a bad one. And I also know she is deeply in love with you. I agreed with Megan on this one. Ultimately, you either have to believe in them or not. That is something only you can decide, she said. That night I went home and asked Celia to come up to the house. We made small talk for a few minutes. I could tell she was nervous. I had a couple questions for her, and I told her she needed to be absolutely honest. She agreed. I asked if she felt like the whole club scene was important to her. I asked exactly what happened the night she and Brandy went to dust. And I asked her about the true nature of her relationship with Marcus. She told me that no, the clubs were not important. That Brandy got her at a weak moment. She was bored and lonely and just wanted to have fun. Yes, Marcus was hitting on her, but she was not interested in him like that. Yes, the attention from those guys made her feel good, but she had never done anything other than being groped a few times on the dance floor. I thought about that and what she said sounded sincere and consistent of what my impressions are of her. I told her this was a good first step. She asked if she could stay in our bed tonight and I agreed. I had no intention of having sex with her but I was unsuccessful with that intention. Though the holidays, the wedding and life went on. My radar was up a little and I watched closely. Nothing made me think anything was wrong. Celia was loving and affectionate. For my January trip, she took the week off from work went with me, and we spent the weekend in snowy Boulder. We had a great time. The whole dust incident was fading from memory. We were married in February and it was a wonderful event. I met her mom and several members of her family. There were less than 100 people total, family, the Robinsons and some close friends. None of her pals from the dance club, except Brandy. We honeymooned on St. Martin in the Caribbean. It was different from Hawaii. 
The ocean was warmer, fewer waves, and a beautiful blue color. You could tell there was a heavy European influence, especially at the clothing-optional beaches. Celia went topless and kept the minimum covered below the waist. We had every kind of sex at least daily for the entire honeymoon. Without question, my best vacation ever. For the next two years, things went along very well. I sometimes would think back to that December and the fact that I almost canceled the wedding and marriage, I was glad I hadn't. I blocked out any seeds of doubt and thought positive thoughts. We kept working on the house, and it was becoming a real neighborhood showpiece. I was proud. Business continued to be good, and we even considered opening up other markets, except currently with people and our operation we were at capacity. I began a good friendship with John Pham. He was a great employee and a good guy. He knew our operations and our machinery. He was the last one to leave the shop at night. Once every few weeks, John, Van, Nathan, and I would sit in the shop after hours with the smell of cedar and sawdust and drink a six-pack. Our talk was casual about the business and life. I enjoyed their company and I think they liked me. Just as things seemed fairly stable, a new competitor out of Asia started importing to the U.S. We first heard about them in Southern California, but we knew we would see them in our market soon. It was an engineered product that looked close to some of our products but was at least 30% less expensive. We started seeing sales slipping. We had been on this steady increase and had invested in resources to meet the demand and now for the first time ever, for me, sales were going the other way. Ted, Kimberly and I met to discuss our strategy with the new competition. Ted felt like the best thing to do was get in front of our customers and review the differences in quality of our products. This will mean more travel and I'm afraid I'm going to need you, Cam, to cover our NorCal market as well as the mountain market. I knew Ted was right, and I knew I needed to do this, but I was stressed out. That night when I got home, I talked to Celia about business and what I was going to need to do. How long is this going to take? She asked. I told her I didn't know. It will certainly be months. Months? She exploded. You're telling me you will be gone two weeks per month, for months? I told her yes, and I could not make any promises. She fumed. Now not only was I stressed out about work, I was getting no support from Celia. We had some good moments, but over the next six months our relationship suffered. The closeness we had was rarely there. I felt like I was fighting a battle in the marketplace as well as fighting a battle at home. After six months of my traveling and her not understanding our marriage was at an all-time low. I had to travel for the business. The travel was helping and business was steady, but it took a consistent effort. She didn't understand. I left on Monday to head to the Bay Area. The weekend had been rough. No closeness, no good conversations and no sex. I started to feel guilty about the travel and called her on Tuesday and said we needed a night out when I got back. She seemed a little more energetic about things and I thought maybe our relationship will start getting better. Friday night we Ubered to Tomlinson Bistro in Old Town. Celia was affectionate. The conversation was good. She even asked me about business. We had a great dinner and a nice bottle of wine and a couple of after-dinner drinks. I thought sex tonight will be great. I called Uber and we waited outside the restaurant for our ride. I went inside to use the restroom and when I came back outside there was Marcus, Bobby and that crowd hovering around Celia. She was smiling and laughing and Marcus had his arm around her waist. I walked over grabbed his wrist to remove his hand. He flinched, kind of clipped my jaw and I shoved him. The next thing I knew I was on the ground. One of them had cold cocked me and I blacked out for a second. When I came to, Celia was helping Marcus up. Then she apologized to them. I was groggy, but I knew what I saw. Then she walked over to me and started yelling, blaming me for the incident. They took off when someone from the restaurant came out to check on things. I was still on my hands and knees with my eyes swelling shut. Just then, Uber showed up. We both got in. I was still dazed. She just lit into me. Why did I have to ruin things? Why did I knock Marcus down? What was I thinking grabbing his hand? It's my body. What were you doing attacking my friends? I didn't say a word. I did not trust myself. I was so angry at her and the situation. Stressed out at work. Stressed out about my marriage. And she is showing far more loyalty to Marcus than her husband. The moment we got into the house, she went to the kitchen to get me an ice pack. She had no idea how mad I was. Get your bum away from me. I roared. It shocked her. She just stood and looked at me. Get your bum out of here. You can stay in the cottage. What is your problem tonight? She lashed back. Tonight. I thundered. My problem is you every night. No support. No affection. Just whining because I'm trying to earn a living for us. She walked to the bedroom, grabbed her stuff, and headed out the back way towards the cottage without a word. I definitely needed the space, and I was relieved when she left. 
I sat at the table and had a brandy. On my second one, I had calmed way down and took an account of my life. I loved my job and even with the challenges, it was a career. I loved my relationship with the Robinsons. Ted was a mentor and a friend. Kim and I had always been friends despite the failed marriage, and Mike was my best friend. I loved my house. I was steadily transitioning it into my idea of a perfect home. Perhaps because growing up housing was never quite sure for my family. Having my own place was extra important. I started feeling better and decided tomorrow Celia and I would talk and maybe even think about counseling. I gave her a little time. At 9 a.m., I walked out to the cottage with a tray of coffee, juice and fruit. I opened the door and no one was there. Her stuff wasn't here and she clearly had not spent the night here. Okay, now what? I puttered around the backyard for an hour or so and called her. Straight to voicemail. Hmm. Mid-afternoon I called again, voicemail. I worked around the house, tried a few more times, then I called Kimberly. She invited me over for dinner and she, Millie, and I discussed my situation. Kim said we had both made mistakes but Millie was firmly in my corner. We discussed all options, including divorce. I was in town this week and after a half dozen more calls and no reply by Tuesday, the ball was in her court. Friday midday she called. She was staying with friends and wanted to come by and get some of her stuff. She came by at 6 that evening. I wanted to talk and she said not yet. I asked where she was staying and she said with friends. I asked who and she said, just some friends. I told her I was gone next week through the weekend at another trade show and that I would like to talk with her when I got back. She nodded okay. She took off in some vehicle I did not recognize with dark tinted windows. I couldn't tell who was driving. I decided to fly out Sunday night for Denver. That way I could hit the ground running on Monday morning. My sales pitch to my customers was quality, service, and the relationship we had established. This compared to cheaper prices as the only value my Asian competitor had. We actually were keeping a good percent of our business, particularly when material defects started appearing from the Asian stuff. I had dinner Tuesday night with Junior Longfellow. He and I were close enough that I told him the whole story about my situation. You know, he said, we don't really need you at the show this weekend. We were co-sponsoring a booth with Longfellow at the trade show. The show will be slow, and if anything I probably have too many people scheduled there anyway. I think you need to get back and take care of business at home. My first reaction was to protest, but I decided to take him up on it. I got an early flight for Friday morning that got me home before 9 a.m. The rest of my week in Colorado went well. I was feeling optimistic about things, though I knew Celia and I had a lot to work on. I drove straight home from the airport and as I unlocked the door I immediately could tell something was wrong. The house was trashed. Had I been burglarized? The closer I looked, it looked like a party had happened. Empty alcohol bottles were all over the place, trash, unwashed dishes. There was a burn mark on my refinished hardwood and a huge dark stain on my couch. I checked everything out. There was no one in the house, but it looked like the guest room bed had been used. Celia? Would she do this? I thought she loved the house like I did. I wandered outside and the backyard looked fine, but I did see a few cigarette butts on the ground. I went to the cottage and opened the door to see Celia and Marcus asleep in the bed. What the hell is going on? She jumped up. You weren't supposed to be home until tomorrow, she said. She was nude and for whatever reason was covering herself up in front of me. Meanwhile, Marcus casually rolled over and stared at me with a smirk on his face. Get the hell out of your a-hole. I bellowed at him. Chill man, I'll be leaving but you understand the lady here owns half this house. You've got two minutes to get the hell out of here. I shouted. We are married and it's my house too, she chimed in. I was seething mad and I knew if I didn't leave these two, something very bad would happen. Two minutes, I said and left. Back in the main house, I called Mike and explained what had happened. He was calm and said he would make some calls to divorce attorneys for me and set something up. Divorce, at this point, seemed like the only option. I called Kim at work and gave her a quick version and she said that she and Millie would come over tonight. I ordered new door locks from the hardware store. I was so wound up and I started cleaning the mess of my house. Mike called back and he had a meeting set up Monday at 11 a.m. with a divorce attorney he was referred to. His name was Darren King. I checked out his profile. Ex-military Jag, originally from Texas. I found his picture, dark hair, a strong jawline and a very no-nonsense appearance. Good. I checked the cottage, and they were gone. It was a mess, too. There also appeared to be evidence of drug use. I got the locks and installed them. By then it was dinner time, and Kim and Millie showed up. They got the whole story, and even Kim agreed. 
There was no way to save this relationship. I was more angry than sad at this point. I met with Darren King, and he was just as he appeared. Firm handshake, looked me straight in the eye. He explained that even though she committed adultery, that would not be a factor in the divorce settlement. He asked about my assets, and I told him about the house, my bank and retirement accounts, and my 9% ownership of specialty timbers. He said it would be likely things would be split 50 to 50, and to prepare for that outcome. He said he would put the papers together, and I could have her served by the end of the week. After I left, I was in shock. My marriage was over, she would get half of the value of the house and half of my equity in specialty timbers. The solidness of my entire life was being threatened. I was starting to get depressed. I called Mike to explain what was happening. After explaining what Darren King told me about 50-50, Mike said, Don't worry about that for now. Just take care of yourself. I may be able to help. I felt a little better after talking to Mike. But what could Mike do? The law was the law. I went into work mostly because I didn't want to be by myself and tried to lose myself in the familiarity of helping run this business. It seemed like both Ted and Kim had talked to Mike. They were both encouraging about what the outcome may be. I wasn't nearly as optimistic. Even John, Nathan, and the warehouse guys were supportive. John walked up to me and said, Boss, we got your back. Don't worry. I truly appreciated their friendship. I had divorce papers served to her at her work on Friday. I immediately got a text from her saying, A hole, you had to send them to my work. I want half of everything. I called Mike who had me call Darren, who told me to cease any communication with her. If she hires a lawyer, I was to contact Darren, and then it would all be done between the lawyers. I couldn't help but worry about my house and my shares at specialty. I was upset and called Mike about it. He said, I know you're worried, but I am working on a few things for you. Have I ever let you down before? He hadn't, but I asked him, what exactly are you working on? Can't say yet, have faith. The weeks went on and my life settled into work pretty exclusively. I didn't even want to work on the house, she may get it. I functioned with a dark cloud, not only my assets were being attacked, but my wife was gone. I spent this time wondering what happened. I knew I was gone a lot, but I thought she understood this was for our future. I had learned in life you make short-term sacrifices for long-term gain. I knew she was a bit of a flirt and liked to get attention from men. That whole dance club scene showed that. I was sad, nervous, and angry all rolled into one. If there was any good news, it was that business had rebounded and we started making some plans to go after the Southern California and potentially Texas markets. We had inquiries about our products from these areas. One night as I was getting home, I saw what I thought was the same dark tinted window car that Celia had been in. I'd ling at the curb by my house and then pull away as I drove up. They certainly knew where I lived. The following Tuesday, I got a call from Darren King saying that he had correspondence from Celia's attorney. They were asking for half of my share of equity of specialty timbers, 50% of my bank account and investments, and the house. I exploded. No way. He told me to calm down they can ask for anything they want. He was working with Mike on something that had to do with my finances and we may have a surprise for them. Two more weeks went by and one night John, Nathan, and Van and I all went out for beers in Old Town. As we were sitting inside the Z-Bar, a couple of Marcus guys walked by and gave me the eye. Then quickly they hurried off. I looked over and John was just staring at them. Those the a-holes, boss? John asked. Yes, I told them. The three of them started talking in Vietnamese. What? I asked. No worries, boss. We got your back. The next day, Darren called me and said we had a preliminary and potential settlement conference next Wednesday at his office. What do I need to do? How can I help? I asked. Just be here at 3 p.m., he told me. I called Mike and told him what was going on. Yeah, I know. We'll be there, too. We, I said. Who is we? Like I told you, have faith. This may work out okay for all of us. And then he hung up. I was mystified, but slightly encouraged. I was there early on Wednesday, and Darren's secretary took me to a back office. After a few minutes, I was ushered into the conference room. On our side of the table were Darren, Mike, a man I did not know, and me. On the other side were Celia's attorney, Rick Blassingame, Celia, still looking good, and I could not believe it but Marcus was there, sitting and smirking. There were no handshakes and no small talk. Darren started, All right, Mr. Blassingame, it's your meeting, go ahead. If I may, he started, Mrs. Joseph is just after what is rightfully due her after your client threw her out of their marital home. Go on. Darren said while staring directly at him. Here is a fair and accurate accounting of the marital assets and handed us all a paper. It read like this. A. 9% of Specialty Timbers LLC, 
one half valued at $360,000. B. 50% of the residents on Ravenscrest Drive, one half valued at $325,000. C. 50% of Mr. Joseph's retirement account valued at $63,000. D. 50% of their joint checking and savings account valued $19,000. C. Miscellaneous prices of furniture and other household items. At this point the man I did not know opened his briefcase and brought out some documents. Mr. Blassingame, allow me to introduce myself to you and your client. My name is Aaron DeVosier. I am an attorney and I have a doctorate in corporate law. I have several documents that you may find interesting, as he handed both Celia and Blassingame some legal-looking papers. Number one, Mr. Joseph does not own the house on Ravenscrest. It is an asset owned by Specialty Timbers, LLC. But sputtered Blassingame, he is an owner of the company and... No, he is not, interrupted Aaron. By their corporate bylaws, a majority can nominate for ownership and in unusual cases where it may harm the company, the majority can rescind shares. If you turn to the third page of the annual meeting, the majority owners rescinded Mr. Joseph's shares before the divorce decree was served. At this point, Marcus yelled, This is bullshit. Half of that is yours. Celia was crying and blasting game was way over his head. Whoever you are, directed a steely-eyed Darren King. Anything more out of you, and you will be removed. In fact, I will do it myself. At that point, Marcus bolted from the room, slamming the door. Celia continued to cry and other than that there was silence in the room. Mr. Blassingame, Mr. DeVosier has examined all the records and has had them certified and endorsed through the Attorney General's Office of the State of Oregon. You are welcome to try to take this to a higher court, but a piece of advice, it will be expensive for your client, and I may add Mr. DeVosier has been a counseling attorney on matters of far more sophisticated corporate law than this. He also, as a favor to his fraternity brother Michael Robinson, is consulting pro bono on Mr. Joseph's behalf. I was in just as much shock as Celia and Blassingame. Darren opened a file folder and pulled out a check. Here is a cashier's check for $25,000 that Mr. Blassingame is our final offer. Would you like a few moments to consult with your client? Yes, I would, said Blassingame. We left and went to Darren's office. I was hugging Mike, hugging Darren, and when I went to hug Aaron DeVosier, he held out a hand and said, A handshake will do. I laughed and shook his hand. Thank you, all of you, but do I not own my house? Mike smiled and said, don't worry, the house is yours. When my old man did that contract with Terry Peterson to buy the house, Peterson wouldn't sell it to you because he was worried you may not keep up with the payments. So the old man was making the payments and you were paying him. I got to thinking about that and Aaron took a peek at the deal and today that house belongs to Specialty Timbers. Once this all settled, we'll get it legally in your name. Um, but what about my shares of the company? I asked, do I still own 9%? No, as a matter of fact, you don't. Again, once this is all settled and done, you will own 14%. I have bequeathed you 5% of my ownership. In all honesty, can you deserve it? The company is doing well, and you are a big part of that. At that moment, Darren's secretary came in and told us that blasting game was ready to talk to us. Back to the conference room, and we all took our spots. Darren began, All right, Mr. Blasting Game, what have you? And your client decided, Well, Mr. King, it is not that simple. Though he does not own the house, Mrs. Joseph spent many hours repairing and working on the house. Furthermore, while Mr. Joseph was on his many travels, it was Mrs. Joseph that minded the house. And, said Darren, blasting game went on, we believe $50,000 is far more in line with what Mrs. Joseph at a minimum deserves. At that, Darren, shut the file folder, stuffed it back in his briefcase, stood up and said, see you in court. And at that, Mike and Aaron DeVosier also stood. Wait. Wait, wait, we'll take the $25,000. Sputtered blasting game. Darren pulled out the divorce decree and both Celia and I signed the agreement. I was free with very little cost. As Celia and blasting game filed out, Mike said loud enough for all to hear $25,000 nice job. We would have gone up to $75,000. All I heard was a single sob from Celia and that was it. That was a little rough, Robbie. Aaron said. Mike replied, not rough enough, my friend. We celebrated at a bar and I happily bought. I was so thankful for the legal advice and especially thankful that Mike Robinson was my friend. Friday was a long day at work, but a good day. Business was good. I felt so good about all the support I got from Ted, Kim, Mike, John and the guys in the warehouse. I just felt good to be part of a good group of people. I was still mad at Celia, but more than anything I was turning sad about the relationship. 
If just a couple of things had gone a different way, I believe we could have been happy. But I also thought, should a strong relationship be that fragile? Hard to say. Little did I know, but as I was leaving work, a dark car with tinted windows began to follow me. I was oblivious, just glad to be heading back to my house. I went immediately to the back deck for my after-work beer. I sat there, closed my eyes, and just exhaled. That was when I first heard them. There was three of them, and Marcus had a knife. Well, 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 look what we have here. What do you want, Marcus? I said. I was scared. What I want is a piece of you. A few fingers, maybe a hand, or maybe something else. I looked around at an escape route, and just then the other two guys grabbed me. This is going to be fun, he chuckled. At that moment, I heard a commotion from back by the cottage within seconds. John, Nathan, Van, and three of their friends all appeared in my yard. You need any help, boss? As a matter of fact, John the first do. Can you help show these guys the way out? Marcus started backing away, and his guys took off. John's guys grabbed them, and John grabbed Marcus. We going to have a discussion, mister, he said to Marcus as he escorted them out of the yard. About an hour later, John came back by himself. I thanked him and asked how he knew they were here. I look out warehouse door and see black car follow you. I see those guys before, bad guys. Well, thank you. How can I repay you? I asked. I was grateful. Repay. Repay what? You know repay, we friends. I was moved to near tears. And boss, my guarantee, those guys don't come back. I didn't want to know. Flash forward five years. Business has its up and downs, but for us, mostly up. I had a new guy working, and though he did not know the lumber business, he was smart, hardworking, and a good learner. I have him working in ops with John and the guys. His name is Chase DeVosier, yep, a cousin of Mike's fraternity brother Aaron that helped me so much all those years ago. Seems Chase was not interested in college and needed a job. At first, I thought I was repaying a favor, but he is working well for us. Ted still comes in every day, but I think he mostly reads the newspaper and talks to old friends. Kimberly is really running the place and I help. I spend a lot of time on the road, but now that we are established, not nearly as much. My love life has improved too. Through my friendship with John and Nathan, I met Van's sister, Jelly. Yes, that's her name. I asked her why she was named that and she told me. When my mom had me and I came out, she said, that's Jelly. So cute. And she is cute. She is a fitness instructor at the Valley Club, and she is in very good shape. I'm almost 10 years older than her, but she doesn't seem to mind. She also doesn't seem to mind that I am not eager to get married again. She says to me, you look at other woman, and I kick her bum, and then I kick yours. I just smile and laugh. Did I ever run into Celia again and see her looking bad or anything? No. Never saw her again. And to be honest, I don't even think of her much. I did see Marcus one time walking towards me on the street. He saw me and crossed to the other side. I am forever grateful for the people in my life. Ted, Kim, Millie, John Pham, Nathan, Van, of course Jelly, but most of all Mike. I love my home and I love my company. I am a very lucky man. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comment section below and don't forget to like, share and subscribe.